So in my work uh, at the University of Michigan, I like to study problems that interface between security and the real world. And there isn't really a problem to me that does that in a stronger way than the idea of using computers for the democratic process. So studying security in voting is fascinating, both, both because of its real world importance and because the shape of the problem is so unique and interesting. Unlike other problems that we know how to solve well with security techniques today, oh, easy things like online commerce and, uh, uh, and banking security, right, where, where nothing could possibly go wrong, voting has this really interesting shape because we want properties simultaneously of high integrity, in other words, that the election outcome is uh, the quote unquote correct one, and also ballot secrecy, because the secrecy of your ballot, that privacy, is what protects not only you, but all of us from you being coerced into voting a certain way or you selling your vote. But observe that these two properties are intention, things we might want to do to protect integrity in an electronic voting system, like maintaining detailed logs, also make it really hard to protect ballot secrecy, especially from the people who are operating the system. And protecting that from the operators of the system is really important in voting because we also have this situation where we really don't have any trusted parties in an election for a high stakes public office. Try to find me uh, a person or an organization that doesn't have a strong interest in the outcome. So um, this is the shape of the problem in, in theory, but let's see how this plays out in practice, because even though it's an extremely difficult problem because of this tension, um, the actual practice has moved along. And in fact, many places have tried or used electronic voting. And we've seen over the past uh, 15 years or so, many instances where security researchers have gotten their hands on voting machines used in practice. and. Um, found some problems. And those problems stem from the fact that um, uh, an electronic voting machine you might see in a polling place, something like, uh, uh, like this, under the surface is really a lot more like this. E-voting is uh, e-voting security from a systems perspective um, imports almost all of the problems of system security more broadly. So a few years ago, I took a look at this system, the Diebold AccuVote TS, which was at the time the most widely used electronic voting system in the United States. And uh, colleagues and I at Princeton took this machine apart. We got one from an anonymous source and uh, reverse engineered it in the laboratory. And what we found was that we could very easily, by exploiting a uh, back door that was there for updating the software in the field, install vote stealing malware and engineer whatever outcomes we wanted. But not only that, we could also exploit the power of computing to make a new kind of attack, something that, that, that wasn't possible in traditional elections, which is that we could make a vote-stealing virus that would spread from machine to machine in the course of a normal election cycle and let us compromise the outcome in an entire state just from one infected machine. Uh, that's not the only place by any extent where these things have been studied. In India, the world's largest democracy, they're also the world's largest user of electronic voting. And uh, again, a few years ago, some colleagues and I um, went to uh, India and, uh, uh, and a government whistleblower who remains anonymous to this day provided us with one of the Indian voting machines to study. And even though the government claimed that these were absolutely secure and tamper-proof, we found some ways to engineer very low-cost attacks on the hardware that would allow us to make the machines behave dishonestly by replacing parts in the field that could be done by um, a very low, uh, uh, a very low cost by um, attackers with minimal skills. Today, uh, new attacks against polling place electronic voting machines are practically assumed by anyone with a computer security background. So it's really not interesting as research to show that yet another one of these is broken. So a couple of years ago, when uh, some uh, colleagues obtained uh, this, this machine, the Sequoia AVC Edge, which is still used in some parts of the country, uh, Ari Feldman, uh, another uh, professor, and I spent a long weekend reverse engineering it for fun. And we turned it into a Pac-Man machine. 
So the point is that today it's well understood that this simple model of electronic voting in the polling place where you have a machine that's just collecting votes in memory, that's the only record. It's under the control of computer hardware and software that can be manipulated. This model is, um, is no longer a safe and respected way of counting votes. And today I'm happy to say that because of the work of many researchers in this field, more than 70% of American voters get to see some physical record of their vote that's safe from computer-based tampering. But what's next? So internet voting is the big question today because you know, I'm a technologist, all, all of, most or all of you are too, and we live on the internet, right? It would be so great if one of the things that we could do with the internet was cast our votes. But when we think about internet voting as a security problem, Right? It's even harder than voting in a polling place on a, secure, on, on, on a possibly secured machine. So you have to think about server-side threats to internet voting because your server must be online in order to let people vote. So if it's subject to denial of service during the limited election period, to uh, people hacking in or insiders manipulating it, or even thinking about the stakes of a major election, the incentive for state-sponsored attackers to compromise the election, change the results of a, a rival country's uh, uh, election for national leadership are so high that we really need to think about internet voting systems as a kind of critical infrastructure that has to be protected from state-level attackers. And then on the client side of internet voting, things look pretty grim there too because you're thinking about voters casting votes from their untrusted devices and they're going to fall for all the same attacks that users do today, to, to phishing, to decoy websites that claim to be the real election, to, to malware on their clients and we know that a, an enormous fraction of clients already have malware. Okay, so those are some of the issues, but how does this play out in practice? And I'm going to use the rest of my time to give you a couple of stories about internet voting systems that have been attempted around the world so far, and we can see what actually went wrong. So the first story is in Washington, D.C., where in 2010, the District of Columbia government designed an internet voting system to let absentee voters abroad and military voters cast their votes remotely using a website. And they did a lot of things right. They hired good developers, they open sourced the system, they solicited public input, they even decided to hold a public challenge a couple of weeks before the general election where anyone from the public who wanted to try to hack in and show that the system was vulnerable was invited to. Um, it's not every day that you get invited to hack into government computers without going to jail, and so my students and I couldn't resist taking them up on that. So let me show you what the system looked like. It's pretty nice web design here. You log in through this website, enter a, a PIN that you got in the mail a few uh, weeks before the election. Um, you download your ballot as a PDF file, fill it out in Acrobat or something, and then upload it back to the system. Now, this convoluted process is because what they ultimately want to do under the regulations is have the same ballot design for everyone and just print these out later in order to count them with uh, postal votes. Then you send in your ballot and it thanks you for voting and tells you to let your friends you voted know you voted on Facebook and Twitter. Nice. <laughs> All right, so my students and I, who are, you know, just uh, PhD students in computer science, not professional hackers or champion CTF uh, folks, um, decided to take a look at this. So uh, what we did was we started by just going through the source code that was publicly available, and um, it was written in Ruby on Rails, a reasonable choice for something like this. And we went through this, and uh, none of us had ever done any programming in Ruby before, but we still sort of followed along, along the attack surface. And after a few hours of reviewing the source code, we noticed this line here. And what's happening here is the server is processing each uploaded ballot um, by encrypting it using the GPG command. And it encrypts it using a public key so that the ballots can't be um, uh, read by someone who breaks into the server. Uh, they'll later be transferred to another machine and decrypted with the private key, which is kept offline. So the problem we noticed here was there. The developer here has used double quotes instead of single quotes. That let us change all the votes. <laughs> and here's why. All right, so the framework they're using processes encrypted ballots um, after they're stored under a temporary file name. 
Um, it sanitizes the base name of the file by re replacing it with a random value, but this particular version didn't sanitize the file extension. The extension that the user uploaded would be used as part of that file name. And in fact, if you put shell meta commands in the extension of the ballot file, they'd become part of the uh, command that would be invoked on the server system. Um, so we had a shell injection attack. And uh, the quotes are just because um, bash in, with double quotes will um, allow shell meta characters to be interpreted. If it was only single quotes, they would not. So um, this is what we actually tested. This sleep five command just tells bash to uh, the, the shell on the server to wait for five seconds. And when we uploaded a ballot with this name, the server took five extra seconds to respond. We knew we had a way in. But let's not get too far ahead. They also gave us a network, uh, a block of IP addresses that we could test. And what we found when we went through this was a lot of other interesting devices that would also potentially give us a way into the system. Uh, terminal servers with default passwords plugged in by serial cables to all of their router infrastructure, for instance, that was going to be used in the actual election. We also found these very nice IP cameras just sitting on the network with no passwords or anything that had views into the data center so we could see the election server hardware, if they were uh, changing it or upgrading it. Um, we could see the system administrators, what times they were at work when they were in the data center. It also let us, like a real attacker, um, get some sense of whether our actions in trying to tamper with the system had been discovered because um, until the moment when they found out, everything seemed normal. But, uh, oh, here's the night watchman. We could see when he was making his rounds. But when they found out that they had been attacked, um, they came bursting into the server room <laughs> and uh, were none too happy. <coughs> so, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The actual attack, the first thing we did was we waited until after 5 o'clock when we knew they went home thanks to the cameras. And then we started exploiting this shell injection vulnerability to run commands on the servers. The first thing we did, just like a real attacker would, wasn't to change the votes, but to steal anything that would help us get back into the election servers later in case we were discovered and cut off. The system would never be as secure again. After that, we changed all the votes. And we replaced all of the ballots on the server with our own ballots, with write-in candidates for uh, the names of evil AI and robots from the movies and sci-fi. Who would the computer want to win? All right, after that, we rigged the system to replace any new votes with our slate of evil robots. And we added a back door that would reveal any new votes and violate secret uh, uh, voter privacy. Just let us know how people really tried to vote. Then we cleared the logs, and we left a calling card, just uh, so they would have some sense of who had done it. What we did was we changed the thank you page at the end um, to uh, add this code. After a delay of a few seconds, the voters' computer starts playing uh, the University of Michigan's football fight song, which goes, hail to the victors, etc. Now, DC did a very smart thing. They, they eventually discovered this when someone else testing the system wrote in to say, everything looks good, but I don't like the music at the end. It's too distracting. <laughs> but they did a very sensible thing. They didn't use the online ballot return portion in the real election. They just let people print out a blank ballot and mail it back. So this is great because there's no single point we can hack into anymore and change all the votes. Yeah, the mailman in a few places might be dishonest, but I can't change all the votes and the election result from Michigan. So um, I want to give you a second case study, and this is more recent. So this is just earlier this year in New South Wales, Australia, where the largest ever internet voting uh, deployment was conducted. So New South Wales has been experimenting with online voting for several years, and in 2015, they deployed a system engineered by um, uh, online voting vendor Seidel um, that was designed to let absentee voters cast their votes, and it received more than 280,000 online ballots. Uh, they said the system uh, allowed people's votes to be completely secret, it's fully encrypted and safeguarded, it can't be tampered with. Well, let's see about that. So Vanessa Teague, who's going to be uh, speaking at the, the end of this session, and I got together, and Vanessa is based in, uh, in Melbourne, so uh, she's been interacting with and studying the Australian online voting attempts for years. 
we together started looking at the system, and this is just quickly what it looks like. There's, um, you go to a web page uh, managed by the electoral authority and log in. You then fill out your ballot, and Australian ballots are hopelessly complicated. I think there are, um, what, more than, more than 100? How many candidates? 300? Yeah, something like 300 choices you have to make on here. Uh, and then you upload the ballot. The system thanks you for voting. And uh, it gives you a receipt number. And this number you can use to actually dial a telephone number, punch in the, the receipt number you get here, and the telephone system will read back how you voted. Now, this is not really at all privacy preserving. This is a total disaster from a point of view of coercion. But this is what they built. So what could go wrong here? Um, they actually planned for what could go wrong. And they did a number of security studies. They brought in experts. They have a detailed threat model that includes uh, attacks by Al Qaeda, uh, by North Korea, and by internet voting hackers, which if you read the details here is my grad student, Scott Walchok, who worked on the DC voting experiment. <laughs> So anyway, the, day, the election took place in the middle of March during 13 days. And uh, due to various constraints, I landed in Australia the day before the election system opened. And after recovering from the jet lag, Vanessa and I started looking at the site. So we did the basic test that you would do with limited time to try to determine whether there were classic web attacks this was vulnerable to. And uh, we also ran the HTTPS um, URL through SSL labs and other tools to look for known vulnerabilities there. And we didn't find anything. In fact, it looked like the SSL configuration was really good. But then we noticed one thing, which is that the server imported some other JavaScript from an external site from um, a, uh, a, a tool called Pewik Pro that's used for analytics. And when we ran the Pewik server through SSL labs, this is what we got. It, it, the server turns out to be vulnerable to the freak attack and to have other configuration problems. So Freak and Logjam were two TLS vulnerabilities discovered in 2015, and both allow you to downgrade a vulnerable server to export grade cryptography, and then to arbitrarily read and change the connection content. So Freak affected most major browsers. It was discovered um, in March, patched about a week before the election. Many browsers still not patched. But then there was Logjam, which is a vulnerability that I was involved in the discovery of. Logjam we discovered at the beginning of May, uh, beginning of March, but didn't make public until May. But it was a vulnerability that would allow a man in the middle to compromise these connections with any major browser. In other words, we had a zero day against TLS that would allow us to affect any vote submitted through iVote. So what could we do with this knowledge? So if an attacker wanted to manipulate votes, um, they could become a network-based man in the middle and um, watch connections to the iVote and PWIC servers. So when a voter loads the iVote site, it makes a secondary connection to this other server to load the, uh, the analytics JavaScript. Um, our malicious network, our man in the middle, can exploit Freak or Logjam to compromise that connection and replace the JavaScript that comes back with vote-stealing malware. That malware then runs within the origin of the iVote site and can allow us to substitute fraudulent votes for any affected ballot. So um, the one last thing that we need a way to do is to defeat that pesky telephone-based verification system. And how do we do that? So it turns out the verification as designed was really easily sidestepped. And there are many different tricks that an attacker could use. Um, one is just to delay showing this receipt number for a little while uh, in hopes that the voter doesn't care, doesn't want to write it down, just closes the window. Um, if the voter closes the window, the attacker submits the, uh, a fake ballot. Otherwise, if the voter has a chance to write this down, it submits the real ballot. Another thing you could do is just replace the telephone number that the voter is supposed to call, which is only something that the voter gets through these websites. So if you're a man in the middle, that's easy to do as well. And in fact, that I think was my uh, cell phone number in Australia rather than the real one. Verification should be a fail-safe mechanism, right? If you have to rely on it for the security and integrity of your election, your security has already failed in another significant way. So we went public with the, uh, we uh, discovered the attack, 
um, in the middle of the election, unfortunately. And we did disclose it promptly to uh, the election authorities via the Australian CERT. Um, but by that time, over 66,000 votes had already been cast while we had a live vulnerability in the real election system. In contrast, the closest margin was only about 3,000 votes. So the future, what's next for internet voting? Well, in California right now, there is an initiative that uh, they're trying to get on the ballot, that a group is trying to get on the ballot that would essentially mandate that the Secretary of State of California uh, implement online voting. Um, the technology, however, is not ready. And what we have to take away from these case studies we've seen so far is several lessons about why this is challenging. So first, th that internet voting involves some of the most challenging open problems in computer security. We have to get these things right. Second, that the commodity tools and frameworks we use for other applications are too fragile for something as critical as determining who's going to lead the nation. Um, voters have good reasons to be skeptical. Um, they, the history of these systems, everything we've studied so far, shows problems can happen. New systems need to earn their trust. And my take, based on everything we've found from researching systems deployed so far, is that it's going to be decades, if ever, before the technology used for security is at a point where online voting can be done with high confidence, and that this is going to take fundamental advances in the way we approach security. Thank you.